Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 744. I wonder what the numerologists would make out of that. For the 8th of January, 2023, Richard Saunders coming to you from a very wet and soggy and storm-damaged Bay Area, San Francisco. Coming up on this week's show, Adrian Hill. You can count on Adrian. She looks at Project Wiki Paranormal with the help of Rob Palmer and me. Now, Wiki Project Paranormal aims to provide a framework for the improvement and organization of articles related to the paranormal, anomalous phenomena, and other similar areas. And in this segment, Adrian will look at the top 10 paranormal pages on Wiki. Lots of interesting topics coming up. Following that, it's an interview with my old friend Susan Gobick from Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia, but this time she is going to tell us about her new book. Well, the book she's currently writing, all about so-called grief vampires. These are the people who apparently, seemingly, or so they say, chat with dead people. Why do they do it? And why is Susan writing a book? Find out later on. Then to round off the show, back to the Trove Archives, the digitised Australian newspapers, where we look for witches in suburbia. An interesting article from 1987. Now, if you want to start this year the right way, and every month this year the right way, head to maynard.com.au and download the free, free Maynard calendar for 2023. Lots of photographs of... <coughs> Maynard, yeah. Download the calendar, print it out, and whack it on the wall. You might have to do, uh, you know, put up a, a thumbtack or a bit of blue tack. Get a hammer out. You know, sort of like an odd job. That's it. That's your task. An odd job around the house putting up Maynard's calendar. Well, lots to get through in the show this week. So it's now time for me to walk into the kitchen. Have a few more of my favorite thing here in the States. Well, one of my favorite things is uh, jalapeno chips. Oh boy, they're good. While I do that, I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. You can count on Adrian with Adrian Hill. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about a little known aspect of Wikipedia, which is called Wiki Projects. According to Wikipedia's own definition, a Wiki Project is, quote, a group of editors that wish to work together as a team to improve Wikipedia. A successful Wiki Project contributes toward Wikipedia's mission of building an encyclopedia." End quote. Now, Rob Palmer, a very long-time Wikipedia editor, is going to give us a little bit more background on exactly what wiki projects are. He's a lot more qualified to do that than I am. Thanks, Adrian. So yes, I'm a veteran Wikipedia editor and I know a little about this complex aspect of the encyclopedia. So let me tell you what I know. There are many wiki projects on Wikipedia, somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 in fact, and each sets its own goals. Like everything on Wikipedia, these projects operate in a collaborative manner, and any Wikipedia editor can join a wiki project by following the directions on that project's main page. The primary goal of wiki projects is to monitor and improve articles of interest to its members. To add a Wikipedia article to a project, a project member simply adds a project-specific tag to that article's talk page, and then rates it on things including importance. In this way, members of that project are made aware that this article should be monitored or perhaps improved by members of the project. Any number of projects can tag a given article for their project. For example, the article about the TV series The Haunting of Hill House 
is tagged by six projects, including American television, horror, LGBT studies, paranormal, and skepticism. One benefit of tagging articles in this way is, for each wiki project, Wikipedia collects the set of all their tagged articles and creates an article named Popular Pages, which tabulates those articles by page views, both for total and the daily average. The data is automatically, periodically updated. For anyone interested in finding out what topics are of high interest to Wikipedia readers, and for helping Wikipedia editors to decide which articles to spend their limited time improving, these popular page articles are invaluable. Thanks so much, Rob. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the articles associated with a wiki project of interest, not only to paranormal enthusiasts, but to skeptics. We're going to look at wiki project Paranormal. This is a wiki project which says that it, quote, aims to provide a framework for the improvement and organization of articles related to the paranormal, anomalous phenomena, and other similar areas, end quote. I'm going to tell you where to find this project's main page, so get your pencils ready, and if you can't write it down right now, Richard will include the links in the show notes as usual. So here we go. So the project's main page is at wikipedia.org forward slash wiki forward slash wikipedia colon wiki project underscore paranormal. And its popular pages article is at wikipedia.org forward slash wiki forward slash wikipedia colon wiki project underscore paranormal forward slash popular underscore pages. Who? I think I got that. For your information, if you see a banner on the Wiki Project Paranormal page, what this indicates is, quote, this Wiki Project is believed to be inactive, end quote. And now, what we're going to do is take a look at the top 10 Wikipedia articles per number of page views per day listed at Wiki Project Paranormal slash popular pages. And we're doing this with the help of our fearless leader, Richard Saunders. I'm so excited to do this project with him. The list that we're using comes from data collected on December 8th, so it's reasonably up to date. And you can check it out for yourself to see if it changes. And Richard is going to start us off. At number 10 on the list with a daily average of 3,996 views is the Haunting of Hill House TV series. According to its wiki page, The Haunting of Hill House is an American supernatural horror drama streaming television miniseries created and directed by Mike Flanagan, produced by Albion Television and Paramount Pictures for Netflix, and serves as the first entry in the Haunting Anthology series. It is loosely based on the 1959 novel of the same name by Shirley Jackson. The plot alternates between two timelines, following five adult siblings whose paranormal experiences at Hill House continue to haunt them in the present day, and flashbacks depicting events leading up to the eventual night in 1992 when the family fled from the mansion. The series premiered on Netflix on October 12, 2018. The Haunting of Hill House received critical acclaim, particularly for its acting, directing, and production values. A follow-up series by Flanagan titled The Haunting of Bly Manor, with most of the same crew and some of the same cast, but a different story and characters was released on October the 9th, 2020. At number nine on the list, with a daily average of 4,494 views, is Area 51. And according to its Wikipedia page, Area 51 is the common name of a highly classified United States Air Force, or USAF, facility within the Nevada Test and Training Range. A remote detachment administered by Edwards Air Force Base, the facility is officially called Homey Airport or Groom Lake, after the salt flat next to its airfield. Details of its operations are not made public, but the USAF says that it is an open training range, and it is commonly thought to support the development and testing of experimental aircraft and weapon systems. The USAF and CIA acquired the site in 1955, primarily for flight testing the Lockheed U-2 aircraft. 
The intense secrecy surrounding the base has made it the frequent subject of conspiracy theories and a central component of unidentified flying object or UFO folklore. I guess we call that UAP now, don't we? It has never been declared a secret base, but all research and occurrences in Area 51 are top secret, sensitive, compartmented information. The CIA publicly acknowledged the base's existence on June 25, 2013. Following a Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, request filed in 2005 and declassified documents detailing its history and purpose. Area 51 is located in the southern portion of Nevada, 83 miles or 134 kilometers north northwest of Las Vegas. The surrounding area is a popular tourist destination, including the small town of Rachel on the quote, extraterrestrial highway. End quote. At number eight on the list, with a daily average of 4,823 views, is Michael, Archangel. According to its wiki page, Michael, also called Saint Michael the Archangel, Saint Michael in the Taxiarch in Orthodoxy, and Archangel Michael is an archangel in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and the Baha'i faith. The earliest surviving mentions of his name are in the 3rd and 2nd century BC Jewish works often, but not always, apocalyptic, where he is the chief of the angels and archangels and responsible for the care of Israel. Christianity adopted nearly all the Jewish traditions concerning him, and he is mentioned explicitly in Revelation 12, 7-12, where he does battle with Satan, in the Epistle of Jude, where the author denounces heretics by contrasting them with Michael. Coming in at number 7 on the list with a daily average of 4,867 views is Skinwalker. And according to its Wikipedia page, in Navajo culture, a skinwalker is a type of harmful witch who has the ability to turn into, possess, or disguise themselves as an animal. The term is never used for healers. In the Navajo language, it translates to, quote, by means of it, it goes on all fours, end quote. Navajo witches, including skinwalkers, represent the antithesis of Navajo cultural values. While community healers and cultural workers are known as medicine men and women, or by other positive nurturing terms in the local indigenous language, witches are seen as evil, performing twisted ceremonies and manipulating magic in a perversion of the good works medicine people traditionally perform. In order to practice their good works, traditional healers learn about both good and evil magic. Most can handle the responsibility, but some people can become corrupt and choose to become witches. The legend of the skinwalkers is not well understood outside of Navajo culture, both due to reluctance to discuss the subject with outsiders, as well as those from outside the culture lacking the lived experience native commentators feel is needed to understand the lore. At number six on the list, with a daily average of 5,410 views, is Atlantis. According to its wiki page, Atlantis is a fictional island mentioned in an allegory on the hubris of nations in Plato's works Timorous and Cratitus, wherein it represents the antagonist naval power that besieges ancient Athens, the pseudo-historic embodiment of Plato's ideal state in the Republic. In the story, Athens repels the Atlantean attack, unlike any other nation of the known world, supposedly bearing witness to the superiority of Plato's concept of a state. The story concludes with Atlantis falling out of favor with the deities and submerging into the Atlantic Ocean. And at number five on the list, with a daily average of 4,009 views, are... Ed and Lorraine Warren, and according to their Wikipedia page, Edward Warren Miney and Lorraine Rita Warren were American paranormal investigators and authors associated with prominent cases of alleged hauntings. Edward was a self-taught and self-professed demonologist, author, and lecturer. Lorraine professed to be a clairvoyant and a light trance medium who worked closely with her husband. In 1952, the Warrens founded the New England Society for Psychic Research, or NESPR, the oldest ghost hunting group in New England. 
They authored many books about the paranormal and about their private investigations into various reports of paranormal activity. They claimed to have investigated well over 10,000 cases during their career. The Warrens were among the first investigators in the Amityville haunting. According to the Warrens, the official website of the NESPR, Vivaglam magazine, and several other sources, the NESPR uses a variety of individuals, including medical doctors, researchers, police officers, nurses, college students, and members of the clergy in its investigations. Stories of ghost hauntings popularized by the Warrens have been adapted as or have indirectly inspired dozens of films, television series, and documentaries, including several films in the Amityville horror series and the films in the Conjuring universe. Skeptics Perry DeAngelis and Stephen Novella investigated the Warrens' evidence and described it as blarney. Skeptical investigators Joe Nickel and Benjamin Radford concluded that the better-known hauntings, Amityville and the Snedeker family haunting, did not happen and had been invented. At number four on the list, with a daily average of 8,178 views, is Grigory Rasputin. According to his wiki page, Grigory Yefimovich Rasputin, 1869-1916, was a Russian mystic and self-proclaimed holy man, he is best known for having befriended the royal family of Nicholas II, the last emperor of Russia, through whom he gained considerable influence in the later years of the Russian Empire. In late 1906, he began acting as a faith healer for Nicholas and Alexandra's only son, Alexei Nikolaevich, who was suffering from haemophilia. He was a diversive figure in court, seen by some Russians as a mystic, visionary and prophet, and by others as a religious charlatan. The extent of Rasputin's power reached an all-time high in 1915, when Nicholas left St. Petersburg to oversee the Imperial Russian Army as it was engaged in World War I. In Nicholas's absence, Rasputin and Alexandria consolidated their influence across the Russian Empire. However, as Russian military defeats mounted on the Eastern Front, both figures became increasingly unpopular, and in the early morning of the 30th of December 1916, Rasputin was assassinated by a group of conservative Russian noblemen who opposed his influence over Alexandria and Nicholas. At number three on the list, with a daily average of 5,536 views, is the Bermuda Triangle. According to its wiki page... The Bermuda Triangle, also known as the Devil's Triangle, is an urban legend focused on a loosely defined region in the western part of the North Atlantic Ocean, where a number of aircraft and ships are said to have disappeared under mysterious circumstances. The idea of the area as uniquely prone to disappearances arose in the mid-20th century, but most reputable sources dismiss the idea that there is any mystery. Paranormal Explanations Triangle writers have used a number of supernatural concepts to explain the events. One explanation pins the blame on leftover technology from the mythical lost continent of Atlantis. Sometimes connected to the Atlantis story is the submerged rock formation known as the Bimini Road off the island of Bimini in the Bahamas, which is in the triangle by some definitions. Followers of the purported psychic Edward Casey take his prediction that evidence of Atlantis would be found in 1968 as referring to the discovery of the Bimini Road. Believers describe the formation as a road, wall, or other structure, but the Bimini Road is of natural origin. Some hypothesize that a parallel universe exists in the Bermuda Triangle region, causing a time-space warp that sucks the objects around it into a parallel universe. Others attribute the events to UFOs. Charles Berlitz, author of various books on anomalous phenomena, lists several theories attributing the losses in the triangle to anomalous or unexplained forces. As an aside, growing up, the Bermuda Triangle really scared me. At number two on the list, with a daily average of 8,625 views, is Coral Castle. Coral Castle is an O-lite limestone structure created by Latvian-American eccentric Edward Leedskallian, 1887 to 1951. It is located in unincorporated territory of 
Miami-Dale County, Florida, between the cities of Homestead and Leisure City. The structure comprises numerous large stones, each weighing several tons, sculptured into a variety of shapes, including slab walls, tables, chairs, a crescent moon, a water fountain, and a sundial. It is currently a privately operated tourist attraction. Coral Castle is noted for legends surrounding its creation that claim it was built single-handedly by Leed Scallion, using reverse magnetism or supernatural abilities to move and carve the stones. Finally, at number one on the list with a daily average of 12,632 views per day is something I actually had never heard of before, and I will try my best to pronounce it correctly. It is Utsuru Boon. According to its wiki page, Utsuru Boon was an unknown object that allegedly washed ashore in 1803 in Hitachi province on the eastern coast of Japan. When defining Utsuru Boon, the Boon part means boat, while Utsuru means empty or hollow. Accounts of the tale appear in three texts. Tales from the Rabbit Garden in 1825, Diaries and Stories of Castaways in 1835, and Dust of the Apricot in 1844. And of course, those are translations from the Japanese. According to legend, an attractive young woman aged 18 to 20 years old arrived on a local beach aboard the Hollow Ship on February 22, 1803. Fishermen brought her inland to investigate further, but the woman was unable to communicate in Japanese. She was very different from anyone else there. The fishermen then returned her and her vessel to the sea, where it drifted away. Historians, ethnologists, and physicists such as Kazao Tanaka and Yanagita Kunio have evaluated the legend of the hollow boat as part of a long-standing tradition within Japanese folklore. Alternatively, certain ufologists have claimed that the story represents evidence for a close encounter with extraterrestrial life. And there you have it, the top 10 list as recorded on the Wiki Project Paranormal. Now before you ask, here are the subjects making up numbers 11 through 20. Archangel, The X-Files, David Ick, Bigfoot, Evil Eye, Chupacabra, woohoo, List of Cryptids, Tarot, Cabinet of Curiosities, and at number 20, Bimini Road. On the next segment, I'll look at the Wiki Project for Skepticism and see what the top page views are for Skeptical Inquiry. But for now, this is Adrian Hill, signing off from Canada. ただいま聞いていただいているポッドキャストはオーストラリアからザスケプチックゾーンという科学と論理のポッドキャストです。英語は世界中で数ある言葉の一つですが、このポッドキャストはいろいろな国の言葉で紹介します。ゾーンのTVを調べてホームページの下までにスクロールすると折り紙のピガサスという翼のあるブッダをクフしたリッチャードソーンダスのオリジナルのオリガミのポスターをダウンロードすることができます。Think we need to think. Here's Susan Gerbic.
And joining me now on the line all the way down the coast, down the coast at beautiful Salinas in California, it's Susan Gerbeck. Hello, Susan. Hi, Richard. Hi, audience. Nice to see you, Susan. I mean, we're not that many miles, kilometers, furlongs, chains, leagues apart uh, as it goes. I can't visit you uh, this time, sadly, hopefully hopefully a bit later on in the year. But uh, it's nice to see you because we're... It's great to see you. I love the power of this magical device we have that is <laughs> called Zoom. It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Now, the reason I'm calling you, I want to talk to you because you're writing a book. Is this the first book you've written? <laughs> yes, it is the first book I've ever written. And I never, ever in my entire life would have thought I would be writing a book. Well, don't uh, don't hold back. What's the book all about? It's going to be called Grief Vampires or Grief Vampire. I think we're going to keep it singular. I'm not uh-huh. sure. But Grief Vampire. I like the old Flim Flam Randy's book where it said Flim Flam with the exclamation point at the end. Yeah. But people are telling me I probably shouldn't use that. It makes it kind of hard to categorize or catalog or people are always leaving the exclamation point off. So I think it's just going to be grief vampire. This is the process you go through when you're trying to write a book. <laughs> How, I mean, even coming up with the name of the book or the chapter titles or the cover, it's all new to me and I'm making it up as I go along and I'm getting there. So for those uh, out there who may not have heard this term grief vampire, and it, it gets mixed reactions when you use the term. I know that, but that's another story. For those people who have who may not be familiar, what do you mean? I mean, we're not talking about real vampires with long fangs, are we? <laughs> that might be very interesting too. But no, my expertise is on people who claim to be able to communicate with the dead. So I'm more interested in the psychic-ish, uh, supposed psychic uh, people who say that they can communicate with the dead, like psychic yeah. detectives. Or more of the celebrity type. That's not the rank and file psychic that's at your doing a tarot reading or is at your Halloween festival. I'm more interested in those people that you will find on television or, uh, you know, have some kind of prominence. You're talking about the professionals. This is the, these are the people for whom this is a business. Yes, they have a business. And more than somebody who just has a website and way more than somebody you see on TikTok or Facebook, even though so many of these professionals do have um, TikTok accounts and uh, Facebook accounts and they do Facebook Live and all that. But I- I'm more interested in the Sylvia Brown, John Edward, Thomas John, Matt Frazier, Suzanne Northrup. Jeanette Wilson, the people are going to be chapters of my book. I've done a lot of investigations on them since I started in this community about 2010. And so the book will chronicle in chronological order my experience in the skeptic community, kind of how I joined, why I got interested in psychics, and all the, a lot of the people I've met during the years who have who have aided me on my journey, either by, you know, kind of not doing things right. I've learned from them. You know, you your teachers are the people around you, good or bad. And uh, so I have some, especially in the beginning, um, where I don't feel that the investigations were all that great and why and the mistakes that are made. And then I don't, I try not to make those same mistakes. Now, let's just get back to this term. So you're talking about these very prominent shall we say, so-called psychics, people who claim they can talk with dead people, to be blunt. And the term grief vampire, is that is that a term that you came up with? No, Mark Edward came up with that term. Right, right. And it basically means somebody, whereas a, a vampire will feed off somebody's blood, a grief vampire will feed off their grief. Yeah, yeah, their loneliness, desperation, willingness to believe, gullibility, need to believe, um, and just mainly grief. Yeah, yeah. So these people, they're, uh, you know, what's the old expression? Don't blame the victims. These people are victims, the people who fall for these grief vampires. Absolutely. And that's my message throughout the book, that, uh, that uh, people are vulnerable and at different times of their life, 
and they can fall for different kinds of scams. It may not be a psychic this time. It may be a romance scam. It may be a multi-level marketing scam. It might be uh, something you heard on the internet, some conspiracy theory that you believed in for whatever reason. Um, the victims are exactly that. They're victims of this. Yeah. And it, it's varied. And so we shouldn't blame them necessarily for falling victim to very slick things. And yeah. some of the times it's only during a time, uh, a, a moment in time when you are at your most vulnerable, you've, you know, you're extremely lonely or you're depressed or you've had a, some sort of trauma in your life and you're turning to somebody that uh, looks like they're want to help you out, but actually they have another agenda. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. They, as you say, they're they're well rehearsed in their art. They're skillful. They come across as wanting only to help people for the very best of reasons. But uh, I imagine there's many interesting stories you you outline in your book, um, real life stories. You know, real people being impacted. Um, you're absolutely right. I have a lot of stories. Um, some of them are quite sad. And I do a lot of transcribing. So I will take stories that I've heard directly from audio that I've, we've recorded over the years. And, you know, you don't always get the no, nuance as far as the tone and the words, but I try to get that through with the transcriptions and other things that we'll say and explain. But um, it's quite sad. Um, there's really nothing entertaining about what yeah. these people do. It's, it's, real victimization it's it's really sad and i'm, I'm enjoying writing the book yeah but you know as i write articles for skeptical inquirer i might write an article for skeptical inquirer about grief vampires and then two months later i write another one this time i'm really looking at it in depth and it's one after the other after the other after the other and it, you really see the impact i think that it's it's kind of a hard thing to um to deal with every day, which is what I've been doing lately, is really focusing on getting this done. Wow. I, I, I find this fascinating. I don't envy you because it is a bit of a grind. Now, when and where and how can we expect to see this book? How can we get our hot little hands on it? Will it be available online? Is there a publisher? I wish we could ask a psychic because I don't know. This is my first book. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how this works. <laughs> I'm, I've had many people in the skeptic community for years that I admire that have told me, like Ben Radford, Susan, get the book out. You need to write the book. And right. many people have told me this, including yourself, I believe, Richard. Yes, probably. And so I'm I'm getting it out. And I think, you know, Mark Edwards also written a book and he's been advising me. I It will not be self-published. I sure hope not. Yeah. And I want to be able to have a lot of illustrations and photographs in it because you know i'm a photographer and i love visual things yeah so um i'm trying to get it done by right now i'm at 31 chapters and they're wow. almost everything is written wow i think everything's almost done i'm just right now kind of going through and cleaning everything up and yeah. then i'm going to give it to ben radford to look at and he told me he'd give me his honest opinion on it and then we're going to find a publisher and so you know my goal is richard is I want to go back to Australia and New Zealand this fall. Uh -huh. So that would be, I want to go with my book. So that's my motivation. I'm thinking in my brain, you know, Cycon will be in October. I uh -huh. sure as heck hope it'll be done by October and print and audiobook and then have uh, be able to go over to Australia and New Zealand because I would love to come see you guys. That's my goal is to get back over there in 2023. Last time I was there was 2019. Wow. We came home right before yes. we closed down. It was really yes. amazing. But, um, you know, my I, I'd love to come back. I really would. So I'm hoping that you guys will invite me back and um, I'll autograph the book for you. That is my goal. But no, I do not have a publisher. But All right. All right. So it's it's... It's really, a, a, yes, we'll ask the psychics what's going to happen next, but it's a case of watch this space, watch this space. Susan, I can't wait to read the book. I really can't wait to read the book. I can't wait to hear the audio book because I like audio books. No idea how I'm going to do that. Oh, my gosh, I've been thinking about it because one whole chapter is on Jeanette Wilson. Yeah. And she's the New Zealand uh, psychic meeting yeah. that we did an investigation on. 
I've been toying with the idea of having somebody from New Zealand doing the audio <laughs> part because I've got lots of transcripts in there. I so, see. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, should I should I get one of our New Zealand skeptics to kind of do the audio voice for that? And I think that well, might be kind of fun, but might be kind know. of fun. I can't do I can't do the accent. So it it, it that's a whole different story because uh, then you have to talk to your publisher about uh, audio books and everything. But I could recommend a. a a, a very good voiceover artist who lives in Canada, Calgary, by the name of uh, um, something Hill, Adri Adrian Hill. One of my dear friends, <laughs> yes, but she does have a bit of a Canadian vibe to it. So oh well, she is a great. She does great. There's a lot of really great voices in our community, and we've heard a lot of them on the Skeptic Zone. That's very got, true. You've got a lot of really great voices. It's all those expensive microphones. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Did you buy a new one this year? Um, it's only been a week. Have I bought a new microphone this year? Have I bought a new? No, but I probably will at some stage. But but if you look if you look closely, the microphone I'm using at the moment is right between my eyes. Yeah. Uh, in a style that Brian Dunning taught me, because I'm I'm on the road, so to speak. So I'm not in my regular studio. I'm sure the audience are very interested in that, but I'm sure the audience would be more interested in your book when it comes out. Grief Vampire, Susan Gerbeck will keep everybody up to date when more news comes to hand. But for now, Susan, all the way down there in lovely Salinas, California, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Hi, this is Dr. Pamela Gay from Astronomy Cast. Each week, Fraser Kane and I take our listeners on a fact based journey through the cosmos. With our weekly podcast, we explain not just what we know, but how we know what we know about this universe that we share. Check us out at astronomycast.com and look for us in iTunes, Google Play, and wherever you download podcasts. See you online. Time once again to dive back into those pages at Trove at trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian Government and the National Library of Australia, hopefully for years to come, where you can dive in, dive into the Trove, swim about and find millions of articles going back to Australian published history. Now, as I was looking around Trove, an interesting article caught my eye, and this is about Wicca. Now, according to Wikipedia, different spelling, of course, Wicca is spelt W-I-C-C-A. That's the Wicca we're interested in right now. Wicca is a modern pagan religion. It was developed in England during the first half of the 20th century and was introduced to the public in 1954 by Gerald Gardner, a retired British civil servant. Wicca draws upon a diverse set of ancient pagan and 20th century hermetic motifs for its theological structure and ritual practices. And the Wikipedia page on that is quite extensive. I will link it to the show notes this week. But getting back to the article that caught my eye, and this is uh, a couple of articles, one in response to the other. The original article comes from 1987, from August 30th, printed in the Canberra Times, and the item is called Among the Witches of Suburbia by Karen Harbutt. Here, then, is our work in the pagan way, to make magic in the name of our gods, to share our magic where the gods would wish it, and to come together in our ancient festivals of birth and life, of death and of change in the old rhythm. The furniture is moved to clear a large enough space. A witch pins one end of a red cord 
in the centre of a room, while another pulls it to a length, setting a radius. As a second witch moves around the room, a third follows him with masking tape, marking a circumference. The circle is cast. There are nine witches in the suburban home in South West Canberra. They are pleased to pose for photographs, donning their lightweight gowns and drawing hair or a hood over their faces while the flash bulbs threaten to highlight their features. They are pleased to be photographed if it will present them as they are, at home with their own religion. A book provided for suggestions on possible settings shows naked witches and their partners performing various rituals in and around the circle. But this would not be appropriate, as Canberra witches, at least, rarely went, quote, sky-clad, end quote. Besides, it was too cold for that sort of thing in the Australian Capital Territory. They dress in floor-length gowns, the most elaborate of which is worn by Simon, a slim man with wispy hair and moist eyes, and an ordained high priest of Mat, the Egyptian goddess of truth. How do you like me in drag? He jests. Flouncing his purple gown, the gold embroidery on the skirt edge floating across his bare feet as helps to set up the altar. While photographers take pictures, I kneeled down near the wall of the lounge room and read about the initiation ceremony by the dim light of one of the candles at the eastern point of the circle. Reading from the book, I learnt that the progressive witch, or postulate, standing naked and blindfold, is asked if he has the courage to make the essay. For I say verily, it were better to rush upon my weapon and perish than to make the attempt with fear in thy heart. The high priestess says to him, During the initiation, the high priestess ties the postulate up with cord. She takes the stout cord and ties it around his right ankle, leaving the ends free. She then takes the longer cord and ties his wrists behind his back, bringing the cord around his neck and tying it in front. With the appropriate words, the postulate is announced at each point of the circle and then told to kneel. The high priestess blesses various parts of the postulate's body, the feet, knees, groin or womb, breasts and lips. A measure of a reel of white cotton is taken around the head, the breasts, the hips, and also the length of the body, tying a knot at each point. The cotton is broken, rolled up around the postulate's finger, blooded from a pinprick of the thumb, and then lain on the altar. The postulate is again tied up around the ankles and forced to kneel. Art ready to swear thou wilt always be true to the art? Yes. Thou must first be purified. A scourge that looks like a cat of nine tails, made from knotted rope, is lashed against the postulate's buttocks forty times, and the ceremony goes on. Mm. The formality of the printed word seemed out of context with the scene in the suburban home and out on the lawn, where the cold witch is obliged with a bit of dancing around a very small cauldron, dewy grass sticking to their feet. But back inside the well-heated lounge room, the implements of the craft, including a scourge, brought back the seriousness with which these people take their religion, a seriousness which they often used to mock the Christian fear of the occult. In their gowns, the witches milling around me looked only slightly different than their suburban personalities whom I had met some weeks before. Alan, 37, had been dressed in the pressed trousers he had worn during his day job in the public service. The only thing which had linked him to witchcraft was the five-pointed star around his neck. His wife, Leone, wore an ankh, 
the Egyptian sign for long life. Wendy and Fred, and Fred is in quotes, a young couple who have both been interested in witchcraft for more than 10 years, but have only been involved with their present group for the past two, sat quietly at first, interrupting Simon only when he gave them a chance. Simon, who chose not to give his age, suffice to say he was over 30, was an interesting character who had driven ambulances, worked for the Royal Australian Navy, and studied covens in countries including Ireland, England and Germany. As he said, I've done lots of things. This isn't just a case of the dull public servant looking for some excitement. From his base in Western Australia, he has fought anti-occult crusaders like David Lentin, a former Victorian policeman and now head of a detective agency who once called Perth the witchcraft capital of the country. Mr. Lenton, recently quoted in the Canberra Times, has spoken of carrying out a house raid with police and discovering several Adults eating a live chicken in front of children. And the blood was pouring down their mouths, he had said. Mr. Lenton is working on a report on the extent of the occult in Australia, which he intends to present to the federal government on its completion. The witches complained that a fear of the occult had led to such isolated instance as were published through Mr. Lenton becoming seen as the norm. When 64 animals were slaughtered at the Adelaide Zoo in March 1985, witches were the first to be blamed. Witches got blamed for a lot of things. Sitting in a cosy, warm Warramanga home, Simon and his four friends joked about how misunderstood witches and pagans were. They joked about what a misrepresented word occult was. Didn't the public know that witches no longer use brooms? These days they had to buy vacuum cleaners with extremely long cords. Even within covens there is some argument about implements and their ritual use. An explanation of tools provided by Simon explains the controversy surrounding the scourge, saying it is the most misunderstood of the weapons and accordingly is not used by many covens. The scourge is used for purification and enlightenment, although there are suggestions that it has been linked with sexual fantasies, and this puts some covens off. With most mentions of the occult in the media, referring to bloody sacrifices, mutilations, sexual deviance or deaths of misled youths, witches are finding it very difficult to be seen as respectable. The Macquarie Dictionary defines the occult as something hidden beyond the bounds of ordinary knowledge. It also describes it as, quote, not disclosed, secret, communicated only to the initiated, end quote. Wicca, a pagan nature religion, is part of a complex philosophy which Alan, Leone, Wendy, Fred and Simon tried to explain without disclosing too much to the uninitiated. It celebrates the seasons and gods of the seasons and what they represent through agricultural and zodiacal festivals during the year. The law is, and if it harm none, do what you will, Leone explained. You're not allowed to force other people. There's no coercion involved. Another law is that witches obey the laws of the land. Those laws do not rule out the worshipping of their pagan gods or the festivals or dancing naked or sky-clad, as they call it, when the festival or mood takes them. They do admit that for anyone who is a bit unstable, joining the occult would tend to amplify the instability. Alan remarked, If a person has a fault somewhere inside them, then it's going to be pronounced. And if it wasn't going to happen now, it's going to happen later. Alan became interested in paganism shortly after becoming disenchanted with Christianity. The turning point, he said, came during a Sunday service. 
I was very interested in religion and was going to church four times on Sundays. When I was eleven years old, I had a friend who was a bit of a black sheep, and he used to make farting noises in church. Alan recalled, Someone told him, If you really want to become youth leader, you'll stop sitting with this boy. And he had dwelled on what was behind that statement for some time. Craft is what's right for me. It doesn't tie people to the stake. It represents a priesthood of another faith. The witches spoke of different levels of consciousness and celebration in the same authoritative tones as a psychologist would use to explain how a Freudian theory applied to a particular patient, with comments like, Witches live life. They are life. It seemed as if they were making higher beings of themselves and breaking down the barriers between what Christians would call heaven and earth, although they do not believe in the concept. But it is the unknown which the average person may find difficult to come to terms with. The tying of power knots in the cords held by each witch on the edge of the circle and centred over a photograph is a physical action. The healing, said to benefit the person who is featured in the picture, is something else altogether. The occult side of paganism and witchcraft was explained this way. The fact that we are witches doesn't mean our cars don't break down. But, as another said, neither did it mean that they could act to change their circumstances. And there are two photographs accompanying this report. One is a group of people sitting in what appears to be a normal lounge room with a cauldron in the middle and they're all pointing little daggers at the cauldron and the caption reads Alan and the other witches heat knives over the flame of a cauldron and the last picture is a little hard to see exactly what's going on being black and white Uh, people gathered around a table with implements the witches join hands around their altar on which are objects of their ritual So what a fascinating report all the way back from 1987 in the Canberra Times. And this led to a reply. And this was received on the 1st of September 1987 to the Canberra Times. The dangers of the occult. Sir, it is encouraging to learn from Karen Harbert, Canberra Times, August 30th, that the Canberra Coven is relatively enlightened and doesn't indulge in some of the darker satanic practices such as animal sacrifice. It is also good to learn that Mr. Goodman and his associates endeavour not to amplify the instability of the disturbed. A lot of occult and paranormal beliefs are harmless nonsense. On the basis of the evidence which Ms. Harbutt presented, the Canberra witches seem to fall into this category we may presumably conclude that the spells cast by this group are relatively benign. Skeptics don't take a strong stand against the conduct of Wicca rituals in private by consenting adults. It probably brightens up the boredom of Canberra suburbia. Nevertheless, while a lot of occult and paranormal beliefs are harmless nonsense, the traditional aim of occult practice is to use ritual to acquire power and dominance over others. Therein lies potential danger for the exploitation of the gullible. And that signed Dr. William Gray, President, Canberra Skeptics. So what do you think? What do you think? I haven't had much to do with paganism or Wicca over the years it really hasn't come on the skeptical radar very much it's out there I have seen it here and there at Mind Body Wallet festivals or whatever but it's not something that I don't think the skeptical movement has really been involved with too much I wonder what the situation is like where you live 
So there we are, an interesting report way back, all the way back there in 1987 about the uh, witches in suburbia, the suburbia of Canberra. And that reinforces to me one of the things I keep saying, that when you're trawling through the pages of Trove, you never know what you might find. Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Now, if you go to skepticzone.tv and look at this week's show notes, you'll notice I've been adding since last week a little uh, little section there called 10 Years Ago, where you can see what was happening on the Skeptic Zone podcast with a link so you can listen to it 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, the Skeptic Zone was at episode 221 for the 13th of January 2013. And on that show, Maynard interviewed Brian Dunning about worms and other monsters. Dr. Rachie appeared on a national television show to talk about Melanie's Marvelous Measles, a ridiculous book. And we had the Think Tank segment with Diane, Dr. Rachie, Joe Benamu, Aran Segev, and myself. Fascinating to see what the show was doing 10 years ago. Thank you to those people who have been with the show for 10 years plus, or even recently, by uh, supporting the show at skepticzone.tv with PayPal or Patreon. That means the show keeps going, your contributions, and I thank you very much, especially to those people who have just joined this year. And I must thank the uh, wonderful friends, my wonderful friends at the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast, who had very kind comments about me on their show at the end of the year. Much appreciated and uh, very kind of you indeed. But for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from the Bay Area with more rain coming, San Francisco. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter, at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics, or any other sceptical organisation.